Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood, and you are watching the first lecture of the division unit. Now, uh, this unit's all about cell division, understanding the cell cycle. But before we can really understand any of that, we first have to understand the component that's responsible for how all cells are able to function, and therefore the component that needs to be doubled anytime you're making more cells. That component, hopefully you understand now, is DNA. Now, uh, we're going to get into the basic structure of the nucleotide that you should already know about from a few units ago. But then, instead of just jumping into all of the little components and the specifics of DNA, we're going to go through the process that all of the scientists of the century went through, which were the little bitty discoveries that came along the way that all contributed to what we know today about DNA. So we're going to talk about a lot of the big scientific contributions that got us to what we, where we are today. Now, I don't know how fascinated you are going to be by this, but this is about the most drama-filled story that there is in biology. There's a whole lot of backstabbing, a whole lot of conniving and working behind people's backs and people telling people about information that they didn't want to have anyone else know about. There's a bunch of drama that goes on here. And really, as entertaining as it can get, we're going to, we're going to make it that way. So we'll walk through a lot of the big discoveries along the way. Hopefully you'll start seeing a lot of these twists and turns in the story. That, uh, that really are quite fascinating. So first, let's talk about the basic structure of a DNA nucleotide. You should know this already. Remember, nucleic acids are one of the four major categories of organic compounds. Uh, of the nucleic acids, the monomers are what we consider nucleotides. And nucleotides have three basic parts. And what you see here is an example of a nucleotide. The three basic parts are one of four nitrogen bases that you see there on the right. Uh, we'll cover all of the different bases here in a little bit, but all nucleic acid molecules have a nitrogen base there on one side. They have a five carbon sugar right there in the middle. That five carbon sugar is one of two sugars we'll talk about again. And then the object to the left in this case is what we consider a phosphate. In my honors kids, you should know about phosphate groups pretty well. Phosphorus with oxygen surrounding it. Uh, we've talked about that before with functional groups. Now, we're going to be focusing in on DNA here. Now, you should remember there are actually two general categories of nucleic acids. Besides DNA, there's also RNA. We're going to talk about RNA a little bit later in the year. This unit, we're focusing specifically on DNA. So the nucleotide that we're going to focus in on here is actually a DNA nucleotide. And that's important for a few specific reasons. The most striking one right here for this diagram is the type of sugar that's represented there in the middle. The sugar in DNA is called deoxyribose. And it's called deoxyribose specifically because of this hydrogen that you see here. This second carbon, this is the second carbon in the chain if you start from the first one there on the right and swing your way around, that second carbon on the chain extends off to this hydrogen. Now if it extended out to a hydroxyl group, which meant there was an oxygen and a hydrogen, then this wouldn't be deoxyribose, it would actually be ribose. So the reason it's called deoxyribose is because it's not an OH there, it's just an H. So it was literally deoxyd, the oxygen was taken out. So this is a deoxyribose sugar, which is the sugar that you'll, you're going to find in any DNA nucleotide. And that's actually where the name DNA comes from. So we know it's a nucleic acid. That's what the NA stands for. The first letter there, the DNA, the D, actually stands for the type of sugar. So this molecule is called deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's because that sugar, again, is called deoxyribose. So you'll always see a deoxyribose sugar there in the middle. Then on one side, you have a phosphate group. On the other side, you have one of four nitrogen bases. And in DNA, those four bases are A, T, G, and C. The A stands for adenine, the T stands for thymine, the G stands for guanine, and the C stands for cytosine. In this case, it's actually a thymine, but you're not going to have to know the specifics of the bases quite like this, but there are some basics you're going to need to know about. Uh, we'll cover those as we talk about some of the major scientific contributions. So again, this is just a review of what you should already know, the basic DNA nucleotide, uh, one of four nitrogen bases, a deoxyribose sugar in this case, since we're talking about DNA, and then a phosphate group on the outside. And as we when we get to the whole DNA molecule, we'll talk about how it's nothing but a bunch of nucleotides bonded together. Okay, so let's get into some of the, the basic science of this. We, it wouldn't be fair to start talking about DNA without first starting to talk about the understanding of inheritance and the understanding of genetic information getting passed on. Uh, two major scientists that come, on, come to mind when we talk about this are Gregor Mendel 
and Rudolf Virchow. We've talked about Virchow already. Remember, Virchow is one of the contributing scientists to cell theory, particularly the idea that the third part, all cells develop from pre-existing cells. So his contribution is the basic idea that information has to be passed on from one generation to the next. There is no spontaneous generation, whereas Gregor Mendel, as I'm assuming most of you have heard of him before, is known sort of as the father of genetics, and he did a lot of specific research with peas and uh, pea pods and testing out very specific traits and how they get passed on from one to the next and developed unique patterns of inheritance. But both of these guys really didn't understand it was DNA that was passing on the information. All they knew is that somehow information was getting passed on, and in terms of Mendel's case, he recognized there were very specific patterns of how that information got passed. Both of these guys, their big contributions came in around the late 1800s, which is way before any real understanding of DNA started coming out. So again, these guys just had conceptual ideas, but they were very big in the concept that genetic information, something had to be passed on from one generation to the next in order to give the next generation its traits. Another big scientist that came through was a scientist named Frederick Griffith. Now Griffith was doing very specific research with pneumonia, trying to develop uh, vaccines for pneumonia and things like that because it was a, a very rampant disease at the time. Um, the introduction of antibiotics had just begun, so there really wasn't uh, a whole lot of treatment available against something like pneumonia. So Frederick Griffith did an experiment where he was trying to identify ways to attack this specific type of bacteria that causes such a horrible infection and uh, makes a bad respiratory disease. He conducted certain uh, certain round of tests on types of mice, and the tests were based off of two strains of the pneumonia bacteria. One strain he called the rough strain. The rough strain was actually the one that does not cause the disease. So it's in the same category, but it's not the actual one that causes the full-on pneumonia. So the rough strain is what we consider non-lethal. He also conducted research with the smooth strain of bacteria, which was the lethal strain. That's the one that would most likely have a high infection, uh, a very severe infection, and could definitely be fatal, especially in the case of a small organism like a mouse. So Griffith did some basic experiments, and most of the results of his, of his experiments weren't any real surprise. For example, the first experiment. He took the rough strain, which again is the non-lethal strain, injected it into the mouse, and over time, the mouse survived. It had no sort of long-term effects because, again, this was the non-lethal strain. This was nothing surprising, and this is by no means what made him famous. He then took the same basic process of testing, but instead of with the rough strain, he introduced the smooth strain, which is the lethal strain. And again, nothing surprising here. The lethal strain killed the mouse, gave the mouse pneumonia, and the mouse died. Again, nothing surprising. The third test, he took the lethal smooth strain, but before injecting it into the mouse, he actually heated it to the point where it killed off the structure of the bacteria so it couldn't reproduce. So when he heated all the bacteria to the point where it couldn't actually reproduce, that pneumonia strain to where it couldn't make any more of itself, and injected it into the mouse, even though it was the, the lethal strain, it couldn't actually grow into a highly infectious disease inside of the mouse respiratory system, so the mouse was able to fight it off, and it survived. Again, this is kind of interesting, but it was what he expected. He made the bacteria incapable of reproducing, and therefore kept it from really spreading to become a very serious disease inside of that mouse. All of these were predicted uh, results, so again, nothing really groundbreaking. But the big result came here. He took then the rough strain, which remember is non-lethal, and he mixed it in with the heated smooth strain. So the lethal strain that could no longer reproduce was mixed with fully functional rough strain bacteria. So they were all put in together in the same sort of mix and then put into the mouse. Now what do you think happened here? This is the big thing. The mouse died. Now it's the rough bacteria that's actually living. So everybody would have expected the mouse to be perfectly fine. However, what this experiment proved is that somehow the information from that heated smooth bacteria jumped from its own cell into the rough bacterial cell and actually turned that rough bacterial cell into the deadly strain. So one way or the other, the genetic information from the smooth bacteria that could no longer reproduce was actually passed into a, a healthy bacteria that could reproduce and it took over the cell. And now that cell went from being the harmless rough strain into the lethal 
smooth strain and cause the same sort of result that happened in the second experiment. This process of genetic information jumping from one cell to another is something called uh, transformation also known as conjugation and this is something that was a very big deal at the time and is still a very big deal today because it proves that bacteria can actually jump information from one cell to the next. This is something that's a huge contributing factor to endosymbiotic theory which hopefully you guys already know about is how prokaryotic cells could have had their genetic information jump from one into the another. Bacterial cells do this often and this was, was the first time that was actually proven in a laboratory. So this was a big discovery, big deal, genetic information can jump from one cell to the next. This is a big deal. However, at that point, they didn't know what that genetic information was. They didn't know if it was protein, if it was nucleic acids, they didn't know what it was. They just knew it was a big deal. Something controlled another cell and could take it over. So there is genetic information that can jump one way or the other. Then there was another scientist, what is that, like 14 years later, Oswald Avery, who continued on with this experimentation and did the same basic test that happened with Griffith. He took that heated, smooth bacteria, combined it with a living, rough bacteria, but this time, before injecting it into the mouse, he introduced two different categories of enzymes, one at a time. One category of enzymes he introduced was the one that destroyed all proteins. And when you break down all proteins, that meant the proteins could no longer be part of the process that transferred the information. So using the enzyme that broke down all proteins, a protease enzyme is what it's called, uh, and still injecting it into the mouse, the mouse died, which proved something. It proved that proteins weren't the message carrier. They weren't the parts of what was passing on information to the other bacteria. So even though the protein was broken down, the bacteria still became lethal and it still caused the mouse to die. So it wasn't protein that was passing on the information. Then he reversed it and did the exact same test, but this time instead of killing off all the protein, he broke down and destroyed all of the DNA with a DNA enzyme before actually injecting it into the mouse. So when he broke off and destroyed all of the DNA and then allowed the mixing to happen, what do you think happened to the mouse? It survived, exactly, which is Again, proving the idea that this time it's actually DNA that was broken down, and because it was broken down, the information didn't get passed on, and the mouse survived. So Oswald Avery's experiments here were a very clear sign that it's actually DNA that passes on information from one cell to the next, not proteins. And it, it took a long time for the scientific community to sort of jump on board with this, because up to this point it was highly understood that proteins were the big thing about the cell. And it, and it took a very long time for the whole community to really get behind this concept. There's another uh, group of scientists called uh, Hershey and Chase that conducted an experiment. This time, the experiment was done on something called a bacteriophage. This is a virus that's actually um, it passed into bacteria, so it actually causes diseases in bacteria. And um, there was some research done on it. What they did was basically mark the proteins with a chemical and the genetic information of the DNA with a chemical. So the bacteriophages, proteins were marked with sulfur and the DNA was marked with phosphorus. And they let the bacteriophage do its job, injecting its uh, genetic information into the cell and then that bacteria was now taken over by the virus. But then after it was injected, they took the sample bacteria that was now infected by the virus and they tested it for either sulfur or phosphorus. And what they realized was that the phosphorus was the only thing that was being found inside the cell, which meant that when the bacteriophage passed on its information to take over the cell, it only passed on DNA. It didn't pass on any of the protein. The protein stayed out of the cell, which is, again, supporting the idea that it's DNA, this the genetic information that gets passed and actually takes over a cell and makes it function differently, not protein. So these two were very big in moving the tides away from protein and towards DNA as being the actual genetic information holder. But again, even at this point, it wasn't universally accepted. But these two discoveries and these two experiments were very big in moving us into our understanding that DNA is what actually passes information from one cell to the next. Uh, the next big contribution, actually this came right before uh, Hershey and Chase, but I wanted to talk about Avery and Chase together at the same time since they both kind of contributed to our a common understanding. Uh, just before the Hershey Chase experiment in 1950 was another scientist named Erwin Chargoff. He was doing a lot of specific research with the DNA molecule, not yet understanding necessarily that it's what passed on the information, but that rumbling was definitely going on in the scientific community. So he did a lot of research within DNA and the structure and components of it. 
His big discovery is what's now considered Chargoff's rule. And Chargoff's rule is very, ba very basic, very straightforward. Of those four bases that we've talked about that are found in a DNA nucleotide, it's either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Of those four bases, he went through a very specific representation of proportion to figure out exactly how many times he'd see each one in a human DNA line. And what he came up with was really surprising. It ended up that he found that adenine and thymine were both present right around 20% of the time. So about 20% of the DNA line was adenine, 20% of the DNA line was thymine. And then he noticed that the other two were right at about a 30% repetition, which means the guanine represented about 30% of the DNA line and the cytosine represented about 30% of the DNA line. So those contributed to the 100% of DNA. So we knew that DNA had adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those were all of the bases in DNA. But what Chargoff realized was that adenine and thymine were at equal proportion, 20% each, and that guanine and cytosine were equal proportion, 30% each. So because of these similarities, this wasn't random. He really recognized there was a reason for this. So he made the judgment that adenine and thymine must always bond to each other, and conversely, guanine and cytosine must always bond to each other. Even though this was done just based on proportion, we now know it to be true. We've done all, there's much more experimentation, a lot more um, technologically advanced ways to test this out. We know this is actually a true fact. Adenine bonds to thymine, guanine bonds to cytosine, with very few exceptions in any kind of a DNA line. Uh, so this is a very big deal. Now you'll notice a couple of other things about the structure here. Of the four bases, they're usually broken into two categories. Two of the bases are what we consider purines. Those are the adenine and the guanines. Purines are the larger of the two groups of DNA bases. The other two bases, the smaller of the two, are considered pyrimidines. These are thymine and cytosine. So you can notice here, based on the structure, adenine and guanine are significantly larger. They're the purines. And then thymine and cytosine are significantly smaller. They're the pyrimidines. So another part of Chargoff's rule is that a purine always bonds to a pyrimidine, with very few exceptions, which is true also. So adenine bonds to thymine, guanine bonds to cytosine. A bonds to T, G bonds to C. You may also notice specifically that the type of bonding that happens here is based on these hydrogens that are in the middle. These are what we consider hydrogen bonds. My honors kids know a lot more about this, but a hydrogen bond is basically nothing more than an attractive force. It is pretty strong, and it's what actually holds together the center of your DNA molecule. So all of the bases in DNA, this is very important that you know, all of the bases in DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds. Everything else is covalently bonded. Everything else has these covalent bonds, very, very strong bonds where they're sharing electrons. But the hydrogen bonding is what's holding everything in between. So another thing to notice, adenine and thymine, because of their molecular structure, have two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine and cytosine actually have three hydrogen bonds. So some very, very important things to understand about the bases of a DNA molecule. And again, every nucleotide has one of these. So if I have an adenine and a thymine bonded together, each one of those has attached on the outside its sugars and its phosphates. And those nucleotides bond to other nucleotides with the bases matching up in the middle. This is a big understanding that came later with a later discovery. But Chargoff's rule is very important for understanding A bonds to T, G bonds to C. Always. A purine to a pyrimidine like what you see here. So we have a basic understanding of the DNA structure, how it all, the bases were all fitting together, but there was a lot of very specific misunderstanding about the overall DNA. And before this young lady, before Rosalind Franklin came in, the understanding was based off of earlier pictures, like this picture that you see here. The earlier pictures, what are called X-ray diffractions, which is basically an exposure of light and then based off what bounces back, you're able to see an image. Uh, the earlier diffractions were nothing like this, and they were very poorly made, which made things very muggy, very hard to determine and to uh, differentiate. And what they assumed up to this point was the DNA was actually was considered a triple-stranded molecule, which meant there were three different strands where the phosphate was directly in the middle, 
The sugars were to the outside of the phosphate, and then the bases were actually on the very far outside. A lot of people really believed this. This was sort of highly understood or highly agreed upon that DNA was structured like this until this woman came in. This woman, again, is named Rosalind Franklin. She did research in a laboratory in England, a very well-known laboratory called King's College. It's in King's College, uh, and she did this X-ray diffraction. Now, she worked very hard on this process, and she worked with a lot of very high-level radiation that was not yet understood to have some very specific side effects uh, at the time. So she did a lot of work with this, a lot of, really exposed herself to a lot of high-level radiation. But what she came out with was something called Photo 51. This is Photo 51. This is uh, probably the most important photo in biological history because of what it was able to prove that was nowhere near understood at the time. This single photo proves quite a bit about the overall DNA structure. Now, the basic thing that you guys need to remember is that this proves that DNA is what we consider a double helix, meaning it's two-stranded and that it rotates or is twisted instead of being flat. Um, basically, the helical shape is proven by this X shape that you see in the molecule. So that very specific X shape that you see there in photo 51 proves its rotation. And here's a way to represent that. Everybody put your right palm out, just like this, so that your palm is facing up. Okay. Now if you do this, you have it just like this, your right arm, your forearm, has two bones. The radius is on your thumb side, so it's on the outside. The ulna is on your pinky side, so it's on the inside. Right now, if you have your palms facing up, your radius and your ulna are parallel. So that means if you looked at an x-ray from the top, you'd see two bones lined up right next to each other in straight lines. Now, without moving your elbow, I want you to rotate your hand so that your palm faces down. Okay? Now doing that, you've just crossed your bones over each other. Think about that. If I did an x-ray from the top of this, your bones would actually cross over each other like an x. So this rotation is represented very well by that X shape. So that helix shape is represented there by the X. So the first big thing that this photo recognized and uh, proved was that there's a rotation going on here. The second big thing was that the bases, which are these little black tick marks there in the middle, were all very, very close to the center, which again was a big misconception at the time that the bases were supposed to be on the outside. So this picture actually proves that the bases are in the middle. The bases are on the inside. Um, there are other very specific things you notice here. Um, the symmetry of those little tick marks along the X there represent very specific rotation, very specific spacing of the bases between each other. Uh, you might notice that there's a gap in both the top and the bottom evenly on both sides. This was considered line four if you were to break it down into multiple uh, lateral lines. The fact that they're missing represents that that's the point at which they actually intersect. So the two bases actually cancel each other out. So that was very big in understanding exactly where the DNA line rotates and how there's actually something called a major groove compared to a minor groove. A lot of big recognition on the little lines that you see there on the left and the right. Those little lines on the outside represents the sugars and the phosphates. Again, disproving the original model that the phosphates are supposed to be in the middle. In this case, you see that the components of the sugars and the phosphates on the outside rather than the middle. So this one photo completely changed what everyone understood about DNA. But here's the problem. Nobody knew about it. This photo was sitting in a laboratory for about a year. So this happened in May 1952. And the immensity of the value of what's here wasn't really expressed to the to the world public and to uh, you know to the scientific community. It was just sitting, and it was amazing how much could be pulled out from this. So Rosalind Franklin had an amazing thing that she did, and should have gotten a whole lot of credit for it. The problem is she didn't let it out, and most importantly, her boss, the person that ran the laboratory that she worked in, didn't actually see the kind of significance to get it out into the public. So here's where a lot of the drama comes in. I told you guys this was going to get interesting, right? Here's where it happens. If you were living back in the early 1950s and someone were to ask you if you think that there was a scientist in the world, anyone in the world that was going to figure out what the DNA model looked like, who it would be, 
most of the people would probably say this guy. This guy's name is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was a brilliant, brilliant chemist who was amazing at figuring out the model of some of the basic biochemistry components that we know of today. Specifically, he's, he was known around the world as the preeminent protein expert. He was the one that figured out a lot of the physical compositions of protein molecules and the different folds and helices and all of those things. So he was very, very well known at the time for his biochemistry and his he was probably the one to beat in terms of putting together the overall components of the first DNA model. However, he, just like a lot of the other scientists I've been talking about, was pulling off of the basic diagrams and the basic diffractions before Rosalind Franklin's. And the ones before had the basic understanding that the phosphates were actually in the middle and the bases were on the outside. And so he believed the same thing. So any work that he did had the same basic structure. Another group of scientists who had a flawed understanding of a DNA structure were these two guys, James Watson on the left and Francis Crick on the right. James Watson, an American, moved over to England and worked in, again, a highly prestigious laboratory, this time in Cambridge University, very close to King's College, uh, in what's known as the Cavendish Laboratory. So these are all very famous labs because of these people and what they were able to identify there. So James Watson goes over to England and works and meets this guy, Francis Crick, and they start working together on their DNA structure. But again, both of these guys had the same misconceptions and they were putting together models with phosphates in the middle because they were using old diagrams, not the one Rosalind Franklin had put together. Now to add some wrinkles to this story, Linus Pauling, uh, right around the same time our, our friend Rosalind Franklin put together that x-ray diffraction, was scheduled to come over to England, come over to London, and um, be part of a lot of, of the discussion of what's beginning to be understood about DNA. But when he went to the passport office to request a visa, the United States government actually denied his request because, again, this is the 1950s. Any of you guys that are into U.S. history know about the big issue with communism at the time. Communism was a big deal, and a lot of the scientific community was sort of getting blacklisted as having possible communist ties and things like that, and Pauling was one of them. So the U.S. government actually denied his request to go to England because of little suggestions and uh, suspicions that he might be part of this Communist Party. So he wasn't actually allowed to go. Now, had he gone, he probably would have gotten his hands on Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction, and using that diffraction and his brilliant chemistry intellect in his background, he would most likely have been the guy that put together the DNA model. But because he was denied the request, he never really got the chance to see this information before it was really all published out. Uh, so he kind of missed the boat on that one. Now, at the same time, another little wrinkle, the Watson and Crick, who are in England, of course, are working very hard, but they're nowhere near the kind of chemistry understanding that Pauling is. So they probably would never have really been able to figure out all the chemical components necessary to put together the final model had it not been for this guy. This guy's name is Peter Pauling. It's Linus Pauling's son. He also, just like Watson, moved to England and, and started working in a laboratory there in London. Now, he got to know James Watson and Francis Crick very well. They became close buddies, all about the same age. And wouldn't you know it, Linus Pauling would talk to his son Peter about all the different contributions and little discoveries he was making about his own DNA understanding. And guess what Peter Pauling was doing with that information? Passing it right on to James Watson and Francis Crick. Now, not necessarily doing it out of spite of his father or anything. He wasn't, he wasn't purposely trying to pass information on. It was just part of an overall intellectual discussion that he would be having all the time with James Watson and Francis Crick. And of course, Watson and Crick just took it all in and they, they really flourished on that information to make their own models that much better. But again, all of these people were working off of the wrong idea, which is that the phosphates were in the middle uh, rather than the bases being in the middle. It wasn't until James Watson finally met with the boss of Rosalind Franklin. This guy's name is Maurice Wilkins. Maurice Wilkins, working with James Watson, actually gave Watson the photo. He gave Watson a chance to look at photo 51 without Rosalind Franklin's permission. And with looking at photo 51 and understanding everything that he knew now based a lot off of what Pauling's son had been passing on to him, he recognized what that photo 
and the value that photo had. So he looked at that photo and his mind started going crazy. He started recognizing that it's not a triple helix, it's actually a double helix, it's two-stranded, it's rotated, the bases are in the middle, the phosphates are on the outside, the shape and the, the, the position and the spacing between the bases, he recognized all of it. And with that last little piece, that last little part to the puzzle, he was able to work with Francis Crick to put together our winner. James Watson and Francis Crick are forever known as the two scientists who put together the first successful and accurate model of DNA. And a lot of people don't know about the story that led up to this. So there's a whole bunch of drama that went through all of this. Um, Franklin was the one who really made the biggest contribution because her diagram was what really put it all together. Uh, but she was more of a physical chemist. She didn't care so much about biology. She pretty much just focused on diffraction. She didn't quite see exactly what was so valuable. Uh, but she should have absolutely gotten the recognition for this just as much as Watson and Crick. The problem a very sad problem that happened with a lot of overexposure of radiation is that um, Rosalind Franklin actually developed cancer and she died very very young and actually died before Watson and Crick and everyone else really got the kind of recognition that they deserved for putting together this DNA model. So when the Nobel Prize was given out for this big discovery of DNA molecule it was given to three people James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins. Rosalind Franklin's boss. All three of them got all the recognition for the DNA molecule and Rosalind Franklin did not get anything because at the time it was a rule that Nobel Prizes are not given posthumously which means it's not given to people who are no longer living. So she didn't actually receive any any of that international recognition for her major contribution to it. So it's a very unique story, very interesting, but the ultimate result is Watson and Crick were the first to put together the full and accurate scientific model of DNA and this is something that's been tested over and over again and with very few little details this is pretty much accurate which is impressive considering they didn't have electron microscopes and things like that to really see what a DNA molecule looks like they trusted and based everything off of these different results and discoveries that came along the way most importantly Rosalind Franklin's and a lot of it came from Pauling's understanding of chemistry but these guys get the credit and good for them for uh, for putting it all together so very important to remember, Watson and Crick are the two scientists that put together the first model of DNA, and they published it in a magazine, a scientific journal called Nature, and it's actually in the same journal that Rosalind Franklin's Photo 51 information was published as well. So this is another big controversy that was all put together. The headline was this from Watson and Crick, and they just used Rosalind Franklin's information as support for this big design and discovery. So again, another kind of stab at Rosalind Franklin. She didn't really get, even get immediate recognition for her own design and for her own photo. She just became sort of a support to this one. So it, it is what it is, right? But these guys are very well known for their discovery. So we now know these basic things about DNA. It's a double-stranded molecule, which means the bases in the middle are connected by hydrogen bonds and they themselves connect the rest of their nucleotides. So the bases in the middle have sugars connected to them and then each of the sugars has a phosphate connected to the sugar. Now each nucleotide bonds to another nucleotide. So the phosphate of one nucleotide actually bonds to the sugar of another. And it bonds in, in a very specific place and if you look there's the two sides are not actually identical. One of them moves in one direction known as the 5 prime to 3 prime. The other one moves in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. We'll talk more about that when we get into uh, division, the division lecture 2 and DNA replication, why that's so important. But it's very important that you understand the basics now of a nucleotide, the bases that go together because of Chargoff's rule, know how they base and how they actually bond together, and that it's a double-stranded helical rotation. So this is pretty much what you guys need to know about a DNA molecule. We know what we know today because of all of the major scientific contributions that came along the way. Most importantly, that suspense-filled ending that put it all together and there were all contributing factors. Every one of them wanted to get the final credit. Uh, but it was ultimately Watson and Crick who made the big publication, made the big realization, and put it all together. All right, so this is DNA. It is what makes you who you are. It's what passes on your information. It's very, very important. And 
when we talk about cell division, we're going to have to focus in on making sure that every new cell that's made has the exact same DNA line and exactly what needs to be passed in so that each of those cells can then turn around and function properly. So we'll get into that process here in the next lecture with Division Lecture 2. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was uh, as exciting as I told you it would be, and I will see you guys next time.